You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with none other than Lucid Planet. All three members, Michael, Darcy, and Luke, are here to talk to me about their new album, and I couldn't be more stoked about it. You guys, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit, and good day. Hello. Yes, thank you for having us, Derek. How's it going there today? I mean, it's super early in the morning. We're probably early, too early to tell. <laughs> oh, it's like, you know, it's meant to be summer and it's pretty overcast and cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. pretty uh, typical Melbourne weather. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe we should uh, go around and let everyone kind of match your voices to who you are. So if you could go around, just say your name and what you play in the band. Sure. Yeah, I'm Michael. I play guitar, do the visuals, and work on the website and all that kind of stuff. Yep. I'm Luke. I sing. I'm the vocalist, and I play bass. And uh, Darcy, I do percussion, production, uh, rhythm guitars, that kind of stuff. So since I have all three of you guys here, I thought a good place to begin would be simple. Uh, How did you guys all meet? (laughs) Um, I, th- I think for us three, at least, um, others have come and gone, but for us, it, it's more of just a friendship thing almost. Like I think. Kind of thing. Yeah, me and Darcy went to the same school, and then we found Luke through friends of friends, I guess, and he was probably in the same circles anyway. We would have met up with him, even if it wasn't for the band kind of thing. So we're all pretty local and just met each other pretty organically. All right. And I'm just trying to imagine the the origins of this. I'm, I'm picturing a metalhead walking around an electronic dance music festival, and he bumps into another guy, maybe wearing a Tool t-shirt, and they start talking. So and get me into this. How did the Lucid Planet concept first begin? Um, you can probably take that on. Yeah. Um, it started more, it definitely started more rock based, you know, almost more of a um, Rage Against the Machine kind of influence to start with. And then we moved more progressive and definitely now I think the the more electronic thing or the more experimental side is, well, one come from the influences and two come from um, just the limitation of the three members. Like it's, I think with, um, yeah, just just by having three members, we've had to really relook at how we're making music and what we're trying to do. And um, yeah, I think I think that's that's as much as anything as the influences are. The the limitation is sort of formed. You know, like it's not even really a limitation at this point. It's that's our strong suit. Like we have we have a different band setup than most bands, and that provides different kind of music, I guess. That's what I was gonna say. It seems like you've embraced a limitation to become your strength and being a trio uh, you all kind of have more room to maybe find your ideas and figure out how you're going to add to the sound yeah i think i think it's like um there's there's less like you know traditional roles like i'm with we play guitar or whatever but pretty much at this point everyone can basically do anything anyone can write electronic music anyone can play the guitar or the bass or write vocal parts or something so we're not really um, limited in that sense. And then without that, it's almost like the other limitation means we're, not, we're less limited in a way. So with the first album coming out, Lucid Planet, uh, it seemed like a, really this, the architecture, the ground floor of what would become Lucid Planet as you guys go on with your uh, discography. This second album seems like everything has just become more cohesive. You brought in more influences and just brought it all together in a very a good package where it's all just, it fits together and cohesive is the only word I can keep coming back to. What was the process like when you guys first started writing it? Was it kind of like, how are we going to do this? What direction are we going to go? It was like, um, the first album was obviously finding the footing on not only like writing music, but how to record an album and all that type of stuff. Like what goes into it to try and make all the songs. Like we want to, make all the songs sound the same or something like that on the first album. Uh, the second time around, it was kind of realizing, oh, you don't need to make everything sound that similar. Um, and by then we'd already started going to uh, electronic music festivals and all that kind of stuff. So um, we met a whole bunch of people there who were, you know, into Tool and Pink Floyd and all that kind of stuff. And we just kind of figured what is it that exists between these two areas that doesn't really exist in music at the moment. Um, so approaching that kind of left it open 
to that new idea that we had that the album doesn't all have to sound the same across the whole thing. Um, so it all kind of went hand in hand eventually. Uh, but that was the idea of the second album was to make something that caters to these like two scenes and brings them together. Yep. And the only thing I'd add to that, Derek, is that the first album I would, I would think was very much written and recorded based around jams and, and instruments and bashing out, bashing out in a rehearsal room. And then the second album was actually very much not that at all. It was more um, sitting in front of a computer, like one of us or two of us or all three of us, and meticulously refining and crafting out a lot of the stuff rather than having actual jams where we produce produce the tracks from. So what was it like when you first started putting ideas together? Was it sort of confusing at first or did it kind of feel natural right, right from the get-go? Yeah, I would say confusing. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it, was, confusing. it was more disjointed. It was more, um, yeah, like Dice was saying, we were trying to blend two worlds. And to begin with, like, we didn't, when you when we're making, say, even the first album, you've got influences that you can sort of look up to and borrow from and, and figure out uh, this is what worked over there. So, therefore, you know, we can sort of, you have guidance, basically. Whereas with this one, we were trying to do something. We, we have literally not, no one to look up to in that regard and how do you how do you blend it in an interesting and real way and to begin with it was more of like a kind of slap this with this one and, and it was quite jarring and not really well done but there was no other it seems like there's no other way to do it you know you sort of just have to start with the rough idea and then slowly hone it in and keep like I don't know keep, keep ch- yeah chipping away and honing it and, and then that eventually makes that cohesiveness that it sounds like on your end but it it definitely wasn't always like this um, well thought out thing. It was just like, let's just slap some things together and then start to like, yeah, mold it into something a bit more cohesive. So maybe it's the part of the incremental process that kind of lends itself to like figuring out how to add these layers together, these different in- ingredients, so to speak, and to a way, because it's easy to imagine to say to someone, okay, imagine if you took a uh, spangle and mixed it with Opeth. And go, yeah. okay, yeah, I can imagine that, but I don't think I could ever write something like that. I would be mm-hmm. trying to reinvent the wheel. But yeah. you guys, you managed to, dis- was it like a process of discovery? Yeah. I was yeah. like mostly, um, I was focusing on my electronic stuff at the time. So it was like a kind of glitch hop uh, kind of thing going on. And I was playing a few festivals and producing that kind of music. Um, so that's a whole different style of production and writing that, I'd never previously done before having come from roots that were strongly in prog rock or post rock and all that type of stuff. Uh, just rock music in general, bass, guitar, uh, drums, that kind of thing. Um, so exploring how that was written and then sort of applying. And it, even in that sense, my production knowledge in that kind of music was pretty like rudimentary. Um, it was like still beginning uh, taking that and then applying it to the Loose and Planet stuff and still learning how everything works in terms of sound and all that type of stuff. Um, I think that's just like how it kept it fresh too because I didn't really know what I was doing in a whole genre of music. Um, and I guess no one ever does and that's what kind of keeps it fresh, but that's what it felt like it kept it fresh for me anyway. You guys really are an independent band as far as it can really go. You guys do everything yourselves, uh, handling, you know, the store, the website, uh, talking to the fans, figuring out the merch, uh, pressing things. (laughs) So for bands that are kind of up and coming and trying to like, you know, get things going, if they wanted to follow your, your path and do everything absolutely themselves, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, maybe, um, maybe just, I mean, it's, this is sounds so obvious, but just do it, you know, like start. And then, um, I don't know if you're going to make a video and you've never made a video before your first one's going to be pretty shit. And then the second one will be a bit better and a bit better and, and just sort of, I don't know, accept that you're going to be a beginner and it's okay to be a beginner and it's okay to, um, it's better to maybe, you know, write, make your own gig poster than it is to off, off source it or whatever, because, by the time you've made your 20th gig poster, you, you've figured out Photoshop pretty strongly. You know what you're doing. You know what style you're going for. And then your gig posters will eventually 
be better than someone else could make them because they don't know your style. They don't know what your whole aesthetic is and everything. So I think with a lot of this stuff, like, like, for, like I'm doing visuals or whatever, like I'm not the best visuals guy. I never really even did this until lucid planet really. And, and then eventually like I would, I wouldn't really want anyone else to do the visuals cause I've got my head around it and I know what, what the music's trying to say. So therefore I'm probably the best person to visually represent it. Um, I think it sort of works like that in, in all these regards. Like Darcy's, you know, might not be the best producer in the world, but he knows the band the best and he knows how to produce this band the best. So therefore he basically is the best producer for this band. And I think that, that sort of goes across the board in all of these things. Like for we know what we want because we do it all ourselves enough and we've done it all ourselves enough because we've just accepted that when you start – with that you just sort of suck at it like we sucked at postage when we first started and now we're good at postage and we sucked at um website design and now we're good at it so i think just um i don't know, give yourself patience like be patient and give yourself enough wiggle room to learn and to and to experiment and to maybe it takes a bit longer than paying a guy to make your website but eventually you'll get a better product in the end because it's your thing and you can make it whatever way you want and you'll learn more you'll learn more for the whole thing yeah. Is it like a solid framework? Um, like um, like Boxy said, on every single aspect of it, even on the business side of things, like you kind of start off as an independent band. You can use things like Bandcamp and you just like put your stuff up and I think you can sell merch through there and all that kind of stuff too. Um, but then you kind of have little to no idea of how any of the cash flow works or something like that. Um I think being an independent band shows you like all these things that you never really thought about and gives you a strong knowledge in like the, maybe even like the business side of things as well as the music side of things. Uh, and if you learn that, then you probably have a stronger foothold when it comes to, you know, if a label approaches you with some kind of deal, um, you probably have a better idea of like what that represents and what they're trying to get out of you. Uh, so you can probably argue yourself better and be like, well, we don't, you know, you, you could say, well, we don't need that because we're kind of taking care of all this ourselves. Or maybe it could be the flip side. You'd be like, yeah, you know what? Sounds a good, sounds like a good deal. Uh, but we can, you can argue and change things when it comes to being approached like that. Mm -hmm. um, but having that framework of being an independent band, I think is like totally like you need that or else you can get stepped on at some point. And I think the only thing I'd add to that, man, is that um, like the, the the true independence um, of of where we stand and how how independent we are and how much we like to keep everything within us just continually comes from not wanting to outsource jobs to other people and to pay other people because of how I guess how particular we are about how our image is going to be and how our website looks and how our videos go and how our songs plan, pan out. Like we're very, very like, you know, the, the truth is that we're very pedantic about every little element. So the idea of off outsourcing that to other people is a bit of a little bit daunting to us. Sometimes we rather just take on the extra work and get it the exact way we see it. It makes a lot of sense from what you guys are just saying about how you guys actually understand your own vision uh, I'm thinking now about how Luke, you've stepped up to the plate to fulfill the role of vocals on this album, but that yeah. wasn't after you guys auditioned like 40 to 50 different vocalists yeah. probably thinking one of these guys has got to be the guy and it must've been super frustrating, but yeah. I think it was all just meant to be because the vocals on this album just totally do it for me. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's amazing. That's really good, man. That's really good to hear. Yeah, honestly, yeah, that was a um, that was a really interesting process that um, like Boxy and I sort of went through. Yeah, probably between forty and fifty vocalists tried out like so many people, remote and in the studio itself. And I think yeah, we honestly just came to the conclusion that uh, uh, the truth is that I ended up uh, you know singing and sort of uh, tutoring through some of these vocal parts. And then honestly, I think Boxy Darcy and I just said to ourselves at one point, we're like, well, if I'm sort of like really coaching these people through this stuff, um, yeah. why, why don't I do it? And like my, my voice is pretty all right as well. Like sometimes my voice was sounding better than, than the auditioners. So I'm like, well, if I actually take some lessons and really refine some of my, my vocal skills, um, why, why wouldn't I? I've, I've got the clearest idea as a founding member. I've got the clearest idea of the vision of the band. Why wouldn't I just pursue it a bit further? And, yeah, I think we're, we're really happy. And that wasn't without – you took it seriously. You uh, went out and took a couple of vocal lessons just to yep. get a good grasp on it. 
For any vocalist out there who's scared to step up to the plate and assume that role, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, I would definitely say that, um, you know, like what I've noticed about people, like it, I honestly think that like a lot of people are just a bit uh, shy to really show themselves and really like put their voice out there for the world to hear. But you might find, and it's and it's a bit of a, like getting, getting accustomed to your own voice is a bit of a skill in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you just sort of like, if you just sort of hear your voice and record it and record it again and, and you get accustomed to it. And yeah, I think if you, if you take some lessons and really understand how to like engage your diaphragm when you're singing, like you might find that like you, it's, it's actually a lot easier than you sort of assume it is just like a lot of the jobs that we've sort of taken on. It's tough at the beginning and then eventually it just becomes, uh, it becomes something that you do. So um, yeah, I, I just think like just 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 work hard. If you think you can sing, then just have a few lessons and 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 really re- record yourself into some recordings. Get used to the way your voice sounds. Try it again. Try it again. It's not going to be perfect the first time. Like the vocals that we ended up with on this album were not by any means the first lot of takes that we made. We it was again it was like a very pedantic, refined process, and it was take after take after take, and we didn't stop until we were happy with it. So. Maybe what we did um, that really did work in our favour was basically um, generally always we're recording and then listening back and recording, listening back. So the feedback loop is really short, so you can immediately hear what's working, what's not working, and then you can sort of readjust that rather than just like singing in jam rooms or rehearsal rooms and then coming into the studio and and bashing it out and then hoping that that's going to be the best without really having this kind of like examination process like we listen to just take after take after take and then you can really just mold it into something that sounds good even if we don't even you know even if he's not traditionally trained for the last 10 years or something like we can hear what we want and we can just keep mor- morphing it into something that's basically perfect and i think that's how we've done it just pedantically morphed it into and just not being satisfied until we both listen to the take and go yeah like we both know that's it like sometimes you can listen to the take and be like you know, people won't know that that's not exactly what we wanted, but whatever, you know, like we know what it's meant to be um, and we know when it hits that exact right spot. So we just kept going until we hit that and that takes us a long time, but at least in the end we can listen to it and be like, we've got no regrets on any of this album because we know that like that's that's as hard as we possibly could have done it and that's exactly what we wanted it to sound like. So, I think uh, all great artists have to have great patience. Hmm, definitely. For sure. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I would agree, man. It's um, yeah, it's honestly been a, it's been a patience process more than really anything else. And like, I just to add to what Boxy was saying, then it's like you know, listening, ha- ha- recording a take and then listening to it straight away, and that actually that repeat listen stuff might happen like you know weeks and weeks later, where you go, oh, actually, you know, I preferred. The, I prefer the, the delivery that we had in three versions before that. So let's like maybe try and revisit that. And it's not just a, yeah, sometimes like a lot of the time it's like record and then listen straight away and figure out what you want. But sometimes it's record and then listen to the version like six weeks later and go, actually, no, nah, I think I think I'd rather it the other way or try, try something new. So it's really is like a hugely a patience game. I could definitely see that being a balancing act for certain moments in the album. Uh, there are, times when you go into like the psychedelic jam or something like that and it's, there's a you know you hold on to a root note and that kind of becomes a drone and mm. the rhythmic all the different elements kind of add up the intensity and it takes a lot of repetition sometimes to build up that kind of intensity before you go on to the next thing when you guys are going back and listening to things was it ever like this balancing act trying to figure out should we repeat this maybe four more times or maybe did we go too far maybe we repeated this too much like how do you yeah. know when to just move on <laughs> Um, you can kind of like, you can kind of make it like, make it go on and on and on without it getting too boring. Obviously there's a point where it gets like super, super like, okay, we get it. But if you kind of set up the intention that you're going to have this big soothing meditative, um, kind of droning part, which I guess like what's that's what a lot of psychedelic music is kind of built upon. It's built upon this, like um, similar to Indian music uh, where this is like a single note drone and everything else is kind of happening around this drone. Um, And it leaves you a lot of room to explore that. So if there's one note happening or maybe there's a few notes that just kind of repeat uh, as like your bass melody, 
there's infinite amount of kind of possibilities you can do to put stuff on top of it. So while there's some repeating elements, there's some things that are coming in and out, whether they be other harmonies or melodies or just random sounds or something like that. But the idea is to like let it drag on and, you know, have the listener be like, okay, you know, I should stop expecting something to happen now. I should just let it go and do its thing. Like stop waiting for something to happen so badly. Just let it kind of, let it do its thing, run its course. And then whenever something does happen, you're like, oh, whoa, holy crap. Like something just, something changed completely. I'd say like Face the Sun would be a good kind of example. There's this long, um, long kind of boom, boom kind of part, which goes into this big ambient didgeridoo part. And I guess some listeners might be like, oh, come on, hurry up. But that's exactly kind of what you want. You know what I mean? Like you want that tension so you can have a better release. And when that little drum fill kicks in, like, you know, something's coming there and there's a payoff uh, and, you know, it makes you, makes you feel good. So that's the idea of like dragging something out for a little bit longer. Um, But yeah, like there's, there's whole genres of music where it's just ambient noise for five minutes and, you know, people listen to that. So it can, it can go on forever. We can just have like one minute of music, like proper drums and guitars and synths and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, I, and then like 10 minutes of just droning and then a little bit of part at the end if you really want to. But and I, and I'd say that like, you know, we're very, we're heavily influenced by that kind of meditative droney kind of music as well. You know, you've got some um, OM and there's like Grails back in the day. Um, and I think yeah. honestly... That was that? That jammy stuff. Yeah, like just jammy, jammy, drawn out stuff. And like uh, the only other thing I'd say is that like we're, I think we're quite skilled as the musicians that we are have been going on almost 10 years now. We're, we're quite skilled at knowing how long to drag on a part or where to cut it short. But also like it's not just like that we sort of do have a bit of an idea. It's Again, it's like the refining process over weeks and weeks, sometimes months, to realise, okay, actually I want this part to double in length because that brings that more impact and therefore more impact to the drop afterwards. So you do sort of get a bit of a, like, you know, you get more of an idea after listening over and over and over and over a period of months, sometimes even years. You guys use so many different instruments on this album. It's, it's really neat. And you brought in a couple of guest, inst, uh, guest artists to play some of those instruments on your album. And you also brought in a guest vocalist. Do you think that's something that's going to continue into the future of this project? You're going to continue to bring in guests or is it going to try to like refine down trying to do more everything yourselves? Yeah, I'd say um, probably the, the first, like would probably continue with the guests, um, continue with an extra vocalist, probably, you know, keep the, if Jade wants to keep being a part of it, continue with the female vocals. Um, it just makes sense for us. Like we're, three guys we sort of um you know create the, the the nexus point and then things build itself around that and i think uh it does i don't know it's sort of like um unintentionally but kind of intentionally in the end like builds this community around it like it is a joint project it is like you know we'll create the foundations and we'll sort of you know create the idea of what it's meant to be and then other people can can bring their influences and bring their ideas into it and I do think that that kind of does make the thing a bit more magical than if it was just three people. Like it's still basically just three people. Like, you know, we are pretty, as we always say, we're pretty pedantic in in all the parts and stuff like that. But, but by having guests, it does allow other people to sort of bring a different flavor that we're not going to really do. And especially with Chris, the drummer, like he, you know, he was going off basically like 70% source material or something like that, 75%. And then he got all the fills and stuff and all the flourishes and and stuff like that is totally him. And we wouldn't have really written the parts like that. Like that's, that's how that's him learning that kind of style or developing that style over 20 years of playing or whatever. And I don't think we could really get better than that just on our own. Like, like the bringing in other people really does add something that, that we can't really do on our own and it's not it's not a musician uh like level issue it's more of just a bringing in different flavors and different ideas from different people who've had different life experiences and sort of make a bit more of a collective story than just a michael luke and darcy story that makes a lot of sense 
Yeah, it's like an um, integral part of the ideology behind what Lucid Planet is in the first place is that, you know, you, we, we could definitely just keep it to us three um, in certain aspects, but to, like, bring in other other parts and other people and expand that kind of um, sonic palette a little bit um, makes it a little bit more, how would you say, it just yeah, brings it closer yeah. to the ideology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a bit more universal and a bit more worldly, especially with the male and female, and then you've got didgeridoo and you've got violin and flutes and guitars and bass and all that and drums. So it's, it's very, like, it covers a lot of bases, which is... Paints a broader picture of what you want to achieve. And we, we never even got to Chris Cameron yet. <laughs> so yeah, thought, maybe you should mention him because you guys recorded the first album and then Chris Cameron actually reached out to you. What was that like? Yeah, um, it was, yeah, amazing, honestly. Like we, he reached out to us after hearing the first album and then being like, what, you know, I hear you're working on a new one. Like I'd want to be a part of it. And his, we watched his videos and stuff. He's got a crazy jazz background and he's got this ambidextrous kid, which is, like super unique in the drumming world normally everything is sort of you know more like right hand dominant or whatever however, which way you think of it this guy has everything basically mirrored on either side so that's a totally different sounds that that or he that allows him to play differently than anyone else would play and he came in yeah with just a level of professionalism that i mean we try and be professional but we're still sort of floaty kind of uh artist types and he's he's an artist as well, but in a, in such a different kind of headspace and he's professional and organized and came in and did, yeah, like he, he played and performed and, and handled the situation better than we could ever have hoped for and turned out to basically be the best drummer for the, like we, we seem to have gotten lucky or maybe just the, with the intention that we're putting out, like we can, we keep getting really good strokes of fortune in that, we probably couldn't ask for a better person for the job at, at in the end of the day. Like his, his style and his a, approach to it all has yeah, been better than we could ever have asked for, honestly. I would agree. <laughs> I, I, this is kind of a staple question I kind of ask for everyone, but for you guys, I thought I would just kind of word it a little differently. If you were to imagine yourselves, if you had a time machine and you could go back in time, to approach yourself when you first started working on Lucid Planet, what advice would you give yourself? Hmm. Tough one. Um, I would personally say the first thing that comes to mind for me is like if I had to approach myself something like eight, ten years ago, I would say don't beat yourself up too much about the the mistakes and the hardships and the, the difficult times because that is what creates the good stuff and creates a mentality in your head where you go, okay, well, I'm not going to make those mistakes again. I'm going to get better. And how do I avoid that mistake happening in future? That is the biggest thing that I would probably say. Just don't beat yourself up too much because there are going to be bullshit mistakes and hardships and just get through it. Um, just keep making mistakes until you don't make mistakes anymore. It will happen. Yeah, also, I think maybe um, we wouldn't – It's a yeah, it's an interesting question because – it's almost like if we could go back and give ourselves advice, maybe we could yeah, limit ourselves from making those mistakes, which could mean that we're not even this, the level that we're at now. Like we wouldn't really want to give too much advice because we might ruin the learning process or the developmental process a bit. And yeah, it really is like sometimes you sort of go through the darkness and then you end up with something more beautiful than what you would have if, if we just had figured it out earlier. So maybe – yeah, like Luke's saying, just just know that it's going to go through darkness and lightness and it's going to go up and down. But ultimately, if you just stay strong with it and, and keep your vision strong, then you'll get through with something beautiful on the other end that maybe has more more light in it and maybe people who are going through dark times or whatever can see that in the music and, and connect with it more and, and know that, like, these guys get it. You know, these guys have been through what I'm feeling right now and and that means something to them. Probably um, listen to more music, like listen to more different music and appreciate different music and don't be so narrow-minded about what you're listening to. <laughs> I think if I learned that earlier on, I'd probably be a better writer. Um, but, yeah, like it is what it is and, you know, I'm a I'm listening to all different types of music now, so what does it, what does it matter? But I still would probably do it. 
Yeah. Because I was pretty, pretty, you know, if you and I would say like that predates Lucid Planet, you know, back in high school listening to just like just Metallica, Pantera, yeah. Lamb of God, like just the metalcore and thrash and all that type of stuff. Um, I'd be like, dude, it's okay to listen to other types of music. It's totally cool. And it, it'll you'll thank me later for it for sure. <laughs> Is there any anything else that you guys would like to say to our listeners? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, like you have touched on a bunch of times, we are independent. And what that means is that we can create basically our own little world. And we've, and we've not only sort of done that, but we've really leaned, lent into that. And that's basically kind of the whole point of the band almost, to make music that's powerful and meaningful and can uplift people in the dark times, but also to create kind of like a different world than what people are generally existing in with, in terms of music um, and, and everything sort of, and in doing that, we've, we've got a whole system that's pay what you feel is fair, which means if you want to, um, if th- you basically choose what the album is worth to you. So if you're some lawyer who's, who's earning 200 bucks an hour and, and it's like this album to me is worth a lot, you know, and, I, and I'm going to have this for the rest of my life, I'll give you $600 for it. Then, by all means, it also means if you're some dude in uh, India who who makes three dollars an hour and is like, dudes, I can't, I, I can only give you, you know, fifty cents or a dollar for this, then then by all means, do that. And if you're a fifteen year old kid who doesn't really have a job or anything and is like, well, I can't really pay for it, dudes, but can I get it for free? It's like, yeah, get it for free. Um, maybe pay us back on your eighteen or share it with a bunch of people or. Um, that cost is already, that cost is already being covered by the person who paid an extra amount of money for the album or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think it allows. It's just a, a more universal way to let everyone uh, not only connect with your music but also sh- contribute uh, what they can. And yeah, like Darcy's saying, it's it, idealistically it will balance itself out. And even if it doesn't, maybe we're still it balances itself out in that we're reaching the right people and we're and we're touching people in a, in a meaningful way. So yeah, I think for all the listeners who are hearing this for the first time, um, by all means head over to the website, lucidplanet.net, which is a totally from the ground up coded website by us. Um, search around that little world a bit and grab the album. If you want to get it for zero dollars to begin with, then, um, consider coming back and paying later at this bunch of merch uh like hoodies and poster sets and shirts and all that kind of stuff uh there's two albums up there they both pay what you feel is fair so you can just grab them both for free now and pay back later or anything like that so yeah i think it's an interesting concept and we're pretty pretty um it's idealistic and it's and it's like a bit of a risk i guess in the traditional sense but i don't know i, I think like we sometimes say like we've we've had our chance to create our own little world in this band and and this is the kind of world we would probably want to live in, you know, where people contribute based on what they can rather than a set price where some people might miss out or some people, but some people it might be so easy that it's not even really a, a, a contribution. It's like, a, it's just throwing some money at it. Um, so I think this is a interesting kind of different way to look at uh, transactions and stuff. And so far it seems to be working and people appreciate it. And we're pretty, pretty solid on that kind of mentality, I guess, at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks yeah. for, thanks for any kind of support, whether it be past or future. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Don't, I don't know. Like what else? The only thing I would say is just like to, to, to those of uh, those listeners who know who we are um, and have supported us in the past by chance, we just want to say thank you so much for your support so far. Honestly, like, the, the fact is that we, we wouldn't and we can't do it without the support and without our listenership and without the constant messages and the and the, the purchases that come through and the donations that come through. We really would not do it and could not do it without you guys. So as, as and that is especially pertinent as a um, as an independent band, fully independent band. Like, you know, we, we, we can't do it without you. So thank you so much for your involvement. And if you ever want to message us or something, then feel free to do so. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point to make as well. As an independent band, like like Mike Poxy was saying earlier, like we ha- have a chance to have our own world. In that comes, uh, you know, the ability to 
um, to, to read messages and to respond to all kinds of messages, um, comments and emails and stuff. So if you, if you contact us as a band through our Facebook page, our Instagram or our YouTube or our website or our email, you will 100% guaranteed talk to one of us. It may take a little bit longer than the big sort of like multi-million dollar companies out there in the world. It might take a little bit longer, but you will 110% talk to one of us. So I think that's a really awesome thing as well. So feel free to hit us up about anything and, and everything. We're keen to chat. And super lastly, uh, last thing is uh, thanks to you, Derek, and basically anyone who reaches out for this kind of thing, and especially you, you seem to have a very good grasp on what we're doing and you you, you know the the backstory and the history and what we're aiming for and you seem to get really get what uh what is sort of special about what we're trying to do here and yeah thanks for being open-minded enough to to understand the music and to sort of go on that those little weird twists that we throw into things and and still stick by it and to want to want to reach out and know more yeah, well, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, to take care of yourselves, and I hope to talk to you all again soon. Yeah, Definitely. we would love to talk again anytime. So thanks, Derek, and yeah, thanks, man. Thank you. Take care. Thank See you, Derek. Later.